Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. So, uh, so we don't need the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much again that you came at the Friday evening. It's really hot, as Mariana mentioned, and I hope that you will enjoy a presentation at the same level as uh, our networking part with Tasty Food. Uh, today's theme is today's topic is how to support Armenian NGOs and avoid disappointment. And let me tell you, first of all, why we came with this idea. Uh, once upon a time, uh, Repat Armenia made a post, quite neutral post, about how to support Armenia in this difficult time. Uh, it was in the second half of September this year, and um, we, with the team, or with the Repat team, we noticed some, some quite strange reaction on this post. Um, the main reaction was, no, if somebody knows Russian, you can read, but if not, I will translate uh, main uh, objectives here. That the main reaction was that we don't believe in NGOs. Um, everyone just taking money, stealing money, and doing nothing. Where are reports, etc., etc. Uh, first, we thought that it's just one specific case, uh, or maybe even some bots, yeah, but. Then we searched for another post of another uh, fund foundation, which I think most of you know. Uh, and we saw that there are also negative reactions, mostly. Uh, we thought that it's maybe diaspora issue, yeah, that only people in diaspora don't believe, but no. Even people in Armenia don't believe, don't trust NGOs. And um, this is why it's quite a big issue for NGOs and th for those who interact with them. And we decided to deep dive in this problem. So let me a little bit introduce myself. My name is Guy Kavitunsi. I have experience in NGO, in a bit in public sector, as Mariana mentioned in Igor's program and in uh, corporate social responsibility. And uh, that's why I was quietly interested in this problem. Uh, let us look at the landscape. What do we have? now in Armenia. Um, of course, if we didn't mention it in the post, I would like to ask you, uh, do you know how many NGOs and funds do we have? But as you uh, already saw our posters, uh, it's, it would be difficult to surprise you. But uh, this figure, 7,000, is not final. Uh, let me explain you how we figured it out. Uh, we know exactly that uh, there are 6,000 NGOs in Armenia. And we know that uh, 911 funds um, sent their reports to st State Revenue Committee. Uh, about it we will talk in the end of the presentation, yeah, about the uh, official statistics. Uh, so this figure will be much, much bigger, approximately eight, maybe 9,000 uh, in total in and funds. Uh, but this number is quite impressive quite big. Uh, so what would I ask you to do is uh, to go to the slido.com or maybe make a photo of this QR code uh, and ask one, answer just one question. Uh, which successful cases of Armenian NGOs or funds do you know? Just put one answer, send it, and then if you know more than one example, uh, send it again. Uh, I'll give you just one minute. Uh, you can send as many uh, cases as you know, and then we will uh, look for the results. Um, while you are sending this, uh, I will comment this slide again. Uh, experts say that approximately 20% of these NGOs and funds really act. Uh, but uh, this is just subjective opinion. Uh, there is no real data on it. Um, the only data we have, and we will also talk about it, uh, only, are only reports which NGOs and funds send to the State Revenue Committee. Uh, but there we have only the expenses, yeah, and some contact info. Maybe the web page, the phone, email, maybe the name of the founder, uh, and expenses. Yeah, that's all. But we don't know exactly in this report what do they do. Yeah, um, there are approximately 50 people in the audience, yeah, and 
they have less, much less than 50, an average <laughs> more than one on the, speak, on the uh, one who is uh, visiting our event. Uh, and in total, uh, if we take only unique values, I think we have approximately 15. Yeah, 15 NGOs and funds. Let's, no, there are people who uh, already work in NGOs, somehow interact with them, somehow familiar with uh, this field in Armenia. Let's assume that we in this audience know approximately 10% of successful cases. Yeah, so maximum, maximum what we can just uh, make an assumption that in Armenia we have approximately 100, 150 uh, successful cases, that, yeah, which we know, which um, we should solve some real social problem and uh, which are quite uh, known and recognized. Oh, why did they did this exercise? Why did they do, we do this exercise? Um, we, sometimes we argue with each other what is a successful NGO, which NGO is successful, which is not. Um, we can, I think we can agree that uh, almost all successful NGOs have three parameters. First of all, they should solve uh, real social problems. Second, they should be somehow known. And the third, they should be somehow recognized. This is the formula of successful NGO. Uh, why uh, this formula is a working formula? Um, let's imagine that we don't have one of these parameters. For example, recognition. Yeah. So we some, have some NGO X, which really solves some problem. Um, people know about it, but they don't believe it. They don't recognize its results, or they have doubts in it. Yeah, we, we know these examples. They are quite known in mass media. Uh, if we don't have recognition, we can't say that this NGO is successful. Um, awareness is also very important because some small NGOs, there are lots of them, they might solve some problem uh, and they might be somehow recognized by the beneficiaries with, which, uh, with whom they interact. But nobody knows about them. It's also the problem. And the third and I think the main problem is that NGO doesn't solve some real problem that exists in Armenia. We will talk about it later. Uh, awareness and recognition, these are manageable problems because you can add some money on the Facebook post, uh, on the fa Facebook advertising, and, or to go to the, some media, uh, etc. Uh, these, these problems can be easily solved. But if NGO has some strange goals, it can't be solved in just in in a week, in a month. So, uh, talking with different people in different diaspora, we found out that there are approximately three problems uh, which we face um, while interacting with each other. We all know that Armenian diaspora is super highly motivated to help to the homeland. We always you know, collect money, send it here, um, make some fundraising events on maybe some, sometimes a million dollars we collect, but uh, we don't know what is in, in result. Yeah? Uh, so we know that diaspora is motivated, uh, but we don't know what is the output of this. So we can um, uh, talk about three problems. The first problem is lack of information about how charities should work. Uh, it's quite normal because uh, some people might think that charity is just charity, I give money and that's all. But it's, uh, it's another sphere which uh, the minority of us really understands until we uh, don't start uh, doing it, it professionally, okay? like any other sphere. So um, sometimes I think the main problem is uh, money is given to the, uh, to the people who really need it, yeah, so some poor uh, poor population, but um, we don't give an opportunity uh, to uh, 
to provide to, to produce something. Yeah, so we give uh, fish instead of teach fishing. Uh, it's a big problem of uh, some NGOs who want to uh, solve some short-term problems. For example, uh, house uh, conditions, yeah, or maybe to give just some money to uh, the people in the villages, etc. The second negative impact of this problem is that activity is not measured and monitored. I'm 100% sure that these NGOs, uh, which we invited today, to talk about the activity, they, uh, they are sure uh, which metrics do they improve, and we will see it in their presentations. But uh, if you ask some other NGOs, maybe, and also if you ask some people who regularly donate to the NGOs, and ask them, okay, you give monthly, for example, ten dollars to NGO X, uh, which problem do they solve? Uh, what is the output of this? I'm not sure that they will give you an uh, exact answer. Uh, and this is the problem. So on the one hand, uh, the people who give money, they think they do good things. On the other hand, they don't know exactly what is the output. Maybe it is bad. And uh, we will analyze it in the, some examples which I prepared for you. Uh, the second big problem is lack of information about Armenians' real needs. Uh, could you please raise your hands, uh, those people who moved to Armenia in the last year? In the last year, last 12 months, okay. So before it, you lived in diaspora, and I'm pretty sure that uh, living in diaspora, you have one imagination of Armenia, you think about some problems, but when you can come here, you understand that the problems are a little bit different from this. For example, just let's imagine that we have some, some Armenian guy in, for example, in New York, in Manhattan, who works in, I don't know, in consulting company, and he wants to improve education in Armenia. And uh, he thinks about some, I don't know, maybe super professional course, etc. But he doesn't know that in, in the big part of Armenian, Schools, there is no heating, there is no toilets, etc. Because he doesn't know real needs of these schools. He has never been there, and it is not his problem. He lives in New York, he does his job professionally, and he just, he doesn't know, he doesn't have this information. Yeah, and it, it doesn't his fault, he wants to do his best, but things happen so that he doesn't understand the reality, because he has never seen it. And uh, the third problem is lack of information about Armenian NGOs. For example, if you are a rich, rich guy from diaspora and you want to invest your money in some social project, how could you find it? Um, okay, you can Google it, you can ask your friends, relatives, um, and that's all. There's no big, I don't know, database or big platform where you can find good projects which fits you, which fits your interest. That's the problem. Uh, also the big problem is that many people, uh, again, because they don't know uh, what happens on the field and information about NGOs is not so widespread, uh, they can do some so-called duplicates. For example, uh, no, we will um, yeah, we'll talk about it later. And lack of trust about, uh, about it we talked earlier. So uh, I prepared three typical cases uh, which uh, we can face in diaspora or living in Armenia. Uh, the first case is about Vachik. Uh, I can tell you that these cases are real. Yeah, maybe I've changed country of a region or maybe the name, but the problem, which I show you it here, uh, is real. It's, it's not, uh, uh, no, I, I didn't uh, just uh, take it out of my mind. So let's meet Vacek. Uh, let's imagine he was born in Armenia in some village in Soviet Union, and uh, when the Soviet Union crashed, he moved to USA uh, to, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, he moved to USA to get some money, 
as lots of our parents or friends did. Uh, he became richer and then extremely rich. Uh, but he was coming back to Armenia, to his village, and he understood that something is going wrong. Yeah, uh, the people who, whom he knew, they uh, lived in the bad conditions, etc. He wanted to do something good for it, for them. Uh, and he decided to give uh, kids a scholarship uh, for those who study quite well. Yeah, so uh, his idea was uh, if kid gets all fives, yeah, five from five, like in America it's A, yeah, mark, uh, he gets scholarship from, uh, from Vachik. Uh, how do you think? Is it a good idea or not? Great, so uh, here's an opinion that it's a good idea because they will be more educated, education will help to progress the country, etc. Yeah, I understood correctly? Great. Uh, another opinion, yeah. Uh, maybe they can set some conditions, mm -hmm. like uh, if we finance your education, and if you do something else after wise, it can be more wise because it will be like more return on, I don't want to say investment, but return on results or something. Mm. So, uh, here's another opinion that um, scholarship should be... Uh, condition. Uh, con condi sh it should be good conditions, but not a scholarship. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. no? Should there have to be conditions for the scholarship. Should be conditions. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay. I mean, this kid who has all the fives, most likely comes already from a good family, because mm -hmm. once again, they have the fives, so they have a good chance. The package, the package does something, but it doesn't solve the social problem. Mm -hmm. This is the intention. Good point. And let us ask the final opinion. Yeah, the third. I think what I, I wanted to elaborate on that to say we need to look at the holistic situation of the entire village, the school, the educators, the system, before we can just say if you do well, what else is going on in that child's family, health. Uh, employment. We need to really advise Vachik to say look outside the education system mm -hmm. and look at what the holistic issues are before you can just hand out this scholarship. It's not as easy as that just to receive the scholarship. It's not going to solve everything. Yeah, it's close to the right answer. Look, uh, I assume that you have some experience in the education. Those people who answered, uh, Vachik didn't because he just earned money and that's all. It, it, his, it's not, again, it's not his problem. He's professional in other fields, not an NGO, but he wanted uh, to do something good. Yeah? Uh, here are two main problems in scholarship. It's a bad idea because, uh, first, uh, marks are not a good motivator for kids. Yeah? Because if you try to get fives and it's your only motivation, it's quite bad. Yeah, you get fives, and what's next? What's your next motivation? You don't have it at all, and um, yeah, and marks are quite subjective. On the other hand, uh, but the second problem, and I will show it here on the slide. Um, sorry. Yeah, uh, people in the village know each other quite well. So for example, uh, I'm the parent of the of the of some kid. And uh, I know the, this teacher. This teacher wants to put a four. I come to him and say, please, put a five. I will do something for you. He says, OK, no problem. Or maybe we will just uh, divide the scholarship into parts. I will take the half here, and I will give the second half to you. That's all. Does it solve the problem? Unfortunately, not. Do kids, not just kids, parents, get the scholarship, not kids? Yes. Parents get the scholarship, uh, give something to their kids, for example, I know, sweets or maybe candies, etc. But education, their education becomes much worse. But parents get money, Vachik is happy because he thinks that, oh, I, I have resulted quite well. The teacher says, give us, please, a bit more money because I have another uh, ideas how... <laughs> how to do them, no, how to spend them. 
And Archic, of course, gives it. Uh, it's the real situation. Uh, I know uh, Vachik, <laughs> and I know the village where it happened, uh, unfortunately. And I'm sure it's not just a specific situation. The situations um, happen uh, in different villages in Armenia, unfortunately. Okay, let's go to the second situation. Uh, let's meet Paranza. Uh, she lived somewhere in um, Middle East, in the Beirut. Uh, and she, sorry, she lived uh, in her country. She has some imagination of Armenia, which, of course, um, doesn't face the real... Um, uh, no, her imagination uh, wasn't... The, uh, didn't match the reality, sorry. Uh, her imagination didn't match the reality, uh, and it also happens with us when we uh, come to Armenia, yeah, especially those people who came, came the last uh, 12 months. Yeah. Um, expensive uh, flats, yeah, and uh, prices are high. Uh, of course, we had another imagination of uh, Armenia. Well, uh, and having this strange, different, uh, not uh, having any connection with the reality, uh, having this uh, perspective, uh, she uh, thinks about the idea. She traveled a lot uh, in the Armenia, in the villages. Uh, she liked the nature, she liked the, f the people, the hospitality, etc. And she saw in one village in Jermuk that uh, people there uh, are refugees from the, uh, some Azerbaijani villages in the end of the 80s. Uh, they get uh, education in Russian and they read Bible in Russian. And she decided, oh, that's the problem. Let me give the Bible in Armenian, and this will uh, change something, change the situation. Of course, people who suffered from Azerbaijani aggression have much more problems than um, reading the Bible. But, sorry, uh, but Paranzem spent money, uh, spent time, uh, made a fundraising for it, uh, give, uh, give these books for her, uh, for, for the people, and uh, um, people didn't understand it uh, because they need something else. But Pranzen was happy yeah, because she thought that she does something good, but in the, in the reality she, <laughs> she didn't do anything good. She just spent money, time, and other resources of uh, people, and what is more important, the hopes because people hoped that she will help them, but she didn't. And uh, the third uh, case, let's meet Artur. Um, he lived in Russia. He had no connection with uh, Armenia, with Armenian relatives, because uh, he thought that, he, that he's higher than uh, these relatives. Uh, he has nothing in common with them. But suddenly, external circumstances changed, and he decided to move to Armenia. Yeah, he, he remembered that, oh, I'm Armenian, I can get, get Armenian passport, I live in Armenia, etc. This happens, no problem. Yeah, we, we should like all of them. Uh, and he understood that he was wrong. He was completely wrong. Again, his imagination and uh, the reality didn't match each other, but in the, in the, good, um, in the good vector. So I understood that he wants to stay here, he wants to contribute to the country, etc. And uh, he decided to fight CO2 emissions because in Russia he was an eco-activist. Unfortunately, in Russia it's not possible to fight uh, with uh, trash uh, CO2. But uh, uh, in Armenia he decided to realize his dreams. And uh, he did a lot of stuff. He bought seeds, he bought equipment, started fundraising. So that uh, it's a uh, no, studied marketing campaign, etc. But in three months, he understood that there are already, already three NGOs which solve the same problem. Uh, he just didn't Google well because he didn't know Armenian, for example, or maybe his networking was not so large, or these NGOs uh, didn't, good made, didn't make uh, good marketing campaigns uh, to reach him. And he didn't know, he spent a lot of money, resources, did it uh, alone, 
uh, but he could cooperate with these NGOs and um, again solve uh, it more and more effectively. Uh, why did I you know, bring these examples? Because uh, it's quite important to understand our problems. First of all, if we talk about uh, development of NGO sphere, etc., we should first of all understand uh, what do we do wrong and avoid doing these mistakes. Yep. Uh, so maybe solutions on this slide might seem quite simple on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, they are basic because, um, again, if we want to, uh, to change something, uh, we uh, first of all try to find who does it already, who does it, does it already. Uh, and unfortunately, some just don't pay some attention to marketing, to branding, etc., and we don't know about them. We start to do it on our own, and um, we waste our resources. So, for example, Enjoy X does something, Enjoy Y does something, and instead of collaborating with each other, it's the problem. So, uh, if we, you, even if you don't volunteer in any NGO, but you find some NGOs quite impactful, and you like what they do, please. Uh, don't mind to share information about them, to talk about them, uh, make reposts. It's not very difficult nowadays. Yeah, just one click and that's all. Uh, so yeah, it's one of the main solutions is just spreading information about them, step by step. Um, remember um, repeating it, because if we don't repeat. Um, I don't know, five times, ten times, people would not remember it, unfortunately. It's how we, our brain works and we get too many information, so that's why we uh, need to repeat it many, many times. Uh, the second problem is uh, sharing reports. Um, there are some big foundations and NGOs, uh, and all of them must uh, share reports about their activity, but unfortunately they don't do that. Um, and, um, for example, you donate to somebody, you have some sub subscription yeah, for donation, monthly, I don't know, weekly, yearly, etc. But uh, those people who give money, they don't even uh, look on the web page and see what do they do, some reports. But uh, big foundations, they, uh, uh, they are checked by big audit companies. Um, the second problem, yeah, which we talked about it, uh, we should support think tanks, which make researchers, because, um, again, um, there are so many problems which we don't know, we don't really realize that uh, they happen. Uh, I, I've talked about schools and the heating conditions, etc. There are many, many problems which we don't know. And we should talk about diaspora, so they don't just collect money and send it to the border village, Say, okay, we sent $10,000, they will buy, I don't know, refrigerators, make some, give some heating, etc. There are more fundamental and long term problems. Uh, yeah, so financial reports, any, any reports and any information about NGOs should be sp spread it. Yeah, and that's why we uh, made this event, yeah, to spread information, and that's why we uh, invited our five. Uh, colleagues, five NGOs, uh, we, whom we trust, whom we know that they are uh, doing real result. They are successful NGOs because they solve real social problems, they are well known, and they are recognized uh, by government, by beneficiaries, by, um, by other organizations, yeah, like Repat Armenia and others. So let us start uh, to talk about them. Uh, yeah. Uh, Almost, sorry, almost all NGOs can be divided in uh, four main categories. Uh, these are education, uh, military, army, uh, healthcare, community development is almost the same as fighting against poverty, and other. Other, for example, ecology, I don't know, uh, it might be. No, sport is somehow related with education, yeah, etc. So we can uh, classify them differently, but main 
uh, categories are here. And uh, when we were thinking about whom to invite to our event, uh, we looked at this uh, classification and decided to uh, invite from each category one organization. Yeah? So first organization is Viva. Anna. Uh, good evening, my name is Anna Rutinova. And <laughs> uh, I'm volunteer of Viva Foundation and uh, board of the member. Фонд организован в 2016 году э, во время Арцахской войны. И председатель фонда Татьяна Ганесян, она должна была мне с ним наступать, так получилось, что ей пришлось срочно уехать в Арцах. Поэтому я... Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Viva Foundation was established in uh, 2016 after four days war in uh, Tsar. Uh, the founder of Viva, Tatiana Aganisian, should be uh, she should be here, but uh, she's now in Artsakh solving some uh, ex urgent problems. Большое спасибо за приглашение и коротко расскажу о фонде. Наш фонд если тезисно, то у нас э, всего три направления. Это медицина, образование и социальные программы. Uh, to take a long story short, we have three uh, directions. It's a healthcare, main direction, education, образование в здравоохранении, да, скорее всего? Образование отдельно, здравоохранение. Okay. Education and uh, social issues. Но э, в основном, конечно, мы занимаемся здравоохранением и, и обучением. И фактически оценить количество, количество нашей помощи практически невозможно, потому что охват очень большой. Э, это все э, региональные клиники, как Армении, так и Арцаха. Uh, it's difficult to measure how many uh, beneficiaries do we have, but uh, we work with most of uh, Armenian regional and Artsakh regional uh, hospitals. Начиная с бункеров, в которых оперировали во время военных действий, и заканчивая ну обычным обычными амбулаториями. We took part in. Um, uh, Tsakh war and we made different surgeries during the war and uh, not only during the war but in the civil time as well in different different conditions. Также мы возим врачей Армении в Москву на переподготовки, повышение квалификации, на обучение и все расходы фонд берет на себя. Вот. И там они в ведущих клиниках обучаются. Also, talking about education, we send uh, different doctors from Armenia and Artsakh uh, to re-educate uh, to leading uh, Russian uh, clinics and uh, hospitals, uh, and they uh, give, uh, get some extra education and uh, extra experience there. И обратно, российские, наши врачи, которые работают в России, они приезжают Волонтеры, то есть они приезжают и работают в региональных клиниках как Армении, так и Арцах. And vice versa, our doctors and volunteers, they come to Armenia and uh, make some uh, surgeries and uh, other, other stuff with uh, local uh, hospitals as well. И uh, хочу заметить, что у нас очень хорошая программа пренатальной Пренатального скрининга, но только в, только в мирное время. Пренатальный скрининг. Окей, у нас есть программа пренатального скрининга, и мы делаем это не только в мирное время, но и в мирное время. Только в мирное время. Есть состояние, э, состояние фонда, когда мы в чрезвычайных ситуациях во время войны занимаемся исключительно военной медициной и сотрудничаем как с Министерством 
обороны, так и с Министерством здравоохранения. Yeah, we collaborate both with the Ministry of Health and uh, Ministry of uh, Defense uh, in the urgent situations. Yeah, that's why we are, we are recognized by them. У нас прозрачная отчетность. Мы публикуем все поступления и все наши расходы, и все это можно увидеть на нашем сайте. И любым донорам мы готовы предоставить целевые договоры о пожертвованиях. Yeah, um, we, uh, we send uh, all reports uh, on the web page and on our Facebook page about our um, expenses and our revenues um, and we are ready to uh, make an official contract with any donor um, if, if he likes, if he would like to do it. И, собственно, вот наши принципы – это прозрачность, отчетность и открытость. Вот по этим трем принципам мы и работаем. We are transparent, open, and, uh, and, treat, uh, and accountability. Yeah, these are our three main principles, and we uh, work uh, with these principles, and we will continue working with them. Um, yeah, let me add something <laughs> from me. Uh, yeah, um, Viva, you can see, I, I don't know, you might see achievements and uh, metrics which uh, this foundation improve. Uh, Viva and Tatiana and her team, uh, they very actively work during some urgent situations when uh, other people are in panic and they don't know what to do. Uh, Tatiana always know what to do. She's uh, first uh, who goes to some uh, border uh, regions uh, and uh, she's first to help and uh, many people mm, I know in Russian diaspora, they trust her and I hope that People in other diasporas as well will uh, know about Vi more about Viva, uh, and will know more about Viva. And uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, talk with Anna and other stuff during our network event. Yeah. So next is Tanya Vakan, goals. Thank you so much for being here and giving me the opportunity to, to represent uh, Goals and have a conversation with you. I think that Goals is one of the uh, unique organizations in the Armenian nonprofit sphere. Um, we are the only sports for social impact organization uh, in Armenia. Now, a lot of people ask me, what does that mean? What, you know, what does sports for social impact mean? Um, Essentially, we use sports as a means, as a method, as a way to engage youth across Armenia to give them um, or teach them skills that are necessary not only to be successful on the playing field, but also off the playing field and in life. We specifically focus our efforts um, working with girls across rural Armenia, coming to understand that they are in fact the most vulnerable um, group in our rural communities. Now, if you're familiar with uh, villages across Armenia, if you've been to um, some of the more remote areas, you will quickly understand that there's not really uh, a space, an institution outside of the school building and school space that kids can go to to have any sort of extracurricular, supplemental, non-formal education. If boys across Armenia have some sort of opportunity to be in a social environment, be that, um, you know, playing outside, um, you know, having more um, opportunities presented to them. In the case of girls from rural communities, there's a great need and there's a great lack of opportunity. And so we wanted to create a safe space where every girl across Armenia can come to the field, be part of a team, learn leadership skills, gain, you know, empo be empowered, and essentially take the skills that they have learned and 
And I like to say this in a very simple way, you know, taking their life from chance to choice. Now, what does that mean? Most of the time, unfortunately, the reality is that our children's lives are mostly dependent on their socioeconomic status, what village they're coming from, what type of education they have, what type of education their parents have had, and they have a probable outcome of what their life is going to look like. We want to, through sports, provide opportunities for our girls across Armenia to have a possible alternate outcome, and essentially taking their life from chance to choice. Now, we want to be very careful and not say that you know, this is the right way and this is you know, what, what you should be doing and everything else is wrong. It's not about right or wrong. It's about having opportunities. It's about having the knowledge, skills, and mindsets to be able to make choices and to be able to have dreams. Um, one of the first time that I went to one of our villages, you know, it's very natural for someone like me to, you know, go up to a girl and be like, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think it's very natural for all of us to, like, have these types of conversations with kids across Armenia. And it really, you know, threw me off guard when this group of particular, you know, this particular group of girls was sort of unable to answer that question. And or give like a very generic answer of like what the expectation is, right? I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer. Realistically, probably never going to happen. But it, it was just an answer that they were taught to give. It wasn't, it didn't um, reflect the realities of what their actual dreams were. And that's when I realized that they actually don't know how to dream. It's not, when I say dream, I mean like have aspirations and, you know, think about what actually they want to do with themselves in the future. And so, you know, when I, whenever I talk to people, I'm like, listen, whatever you think is the reality, take a step back and that's where we're at right now. So how can we sort of get to where they're at, meet them where they're at, and then help support an environment or create an environment where um, we're empowering girls to be able to you know, think bigger, dream bigger, and then give them the tools to be able to accomplish those dreams. And we do this all through sports, because why not? Sports is fun. It's a space where everyone can be inclusive. We specifically pick team sports because we believe that teamwork is a critical life skill for everyone. I personally believe that life is a team sport, and if you don't have the experience of playing some sort of team sport then, or if you have the experience of playing a team sport, then you've already sort of have a leg up when you get to adulthood. Um, the two main indicators that we try to focus around is, one, uh, happiness. So we want to ultimately see our kids happier. And when we say happiness, we mean both physical well-being and also mental well-being. So our educational programs revolve around making sure that these kids have what is necessary to be both <coughs> mentally happy and physically able and happy. And the other indicator that we want to focus on, because we're not, you know, when you go into a community and you do a lot of work in, the, in communities, you're not only impacting or directly impacting um, the children that you work with, you're also having an impact on the community and the space that you're in. Um, just to give you an idea of what that means, sports for girls is highly discouraged in rural Armenia. It's considered a waste of time. It's considered uh, not even thought of to be something that can contribute to a healthy lifestyle. And so when you have now these villages, and we work in over 80 communities, when you have over 80 communities that are supporting, cheering, encouraging the participation of girls in a sport, that's already a dynamic shift in the community's overall um, 
approach, right, to, to you know, also gender empowerment. Um, one of the studies that we did, um, just so we can understand where we're working, and just going back to what Gagik was saying earlier, really understanding the needs of the, the community. Whenever we asked any of our parents, you know, what would you like your son to be when they grow up? They had these high expectations and aspirations for their, for their sons. And whenever we asked them, well, what would you like your daughter to be? Where would you like to see your daughter um, in the future? The ultimate goal was married, married off. Um, if that is a choice, you know, going back to chance and choice, if that is a choice, um, then we are not in a position to judge. However, unfortunately, in most of the cases, it's not a choice. And so, one of the indirect impacts that we want to have, or one of the indicators that we have, or measurements of success, is we would like to see parents have higher expectations for their daughters. So how can we encourage a space and engage the parents um, to, for them to set higher expectations for their daughters. And this, in turn, will create a more holistic, safe space for their girls to then want to dream bigger and want to have, you know, higher aspirations than they would, would normally have. Um, you know, we all know that society has a huge effect on, especially teenagers. Um, and so how can we as an organization, promote the, the overall support of their society to having them, you know, really want to, to, to live up to their full potential, essentially. Um, so the activities that we run, just to give you an idea, we have uh, spring leagues and, and fall leagues for our sports activities. We mostly use, have used um, soccer or football as the sports type, and this was very intentional for two reasons. One, it requires the least amount of infrastructure, so we're talking about um, resources that we would need in order to execute the activities that we would want to have. And two, um, Football is not considered a female sport, let's be honest. And so when you have, you know, rural communities with girls running around in full football gear and, you know, playing the sport, they're, you're already indirectly breaking gender stereotypes by allowing this to happen in your space. And ultimately, you also have, you know, one of the indirect impacts that we have, you have these boys growing up visually seeing girls <coughs> equally on the playing field and hopefully, and this is something that we can measure down the line because we only launched in 2016, hopefully down the line when we have these kids, you know, as adults, as um, when they form families themselves, that this will in turn sort of uh, play a part in the type of parents that they would be to their daughters, to their sons in the future. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. There's so much more I can talk about. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Tenny. Uh, there is much more to tell. I think in some cases or experience. And I, if somebody is interested in the project, I think the project is quite unique for Armenia. Uh, please come uh, during the our network and ask questions to Tenny. Uh, our third speaker is Nane Harutunyan, Voma. I stand here so everyone can see me. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Nane and uh, I am a first aid instructor in Voma, which in translation means it's an abbreviation and means Art of Survivor. So Voma was founded in uh, 2014 and until 2016, we mainly concentrated on active tourism, meaning we had uh, physical trainings, first aid, hiking, mountaineering and climbing, knife throwing, horseback riding, uh, surviving and so on and so forth. Uh, after the four-day war in 2016, we uh, added uh, tactical trainings and combat shooting trainings. In 2020, uh, we completely changed our orientation into military. 
Since then we started uh, our artillery courses, courses of topography, engineering courses and also commander's courses. Besides that, um, we participated in a 44 days war in, within one battalion, consisting of 410 people. Um, well, our battalion has been to Karvajar and um, also it has uh, participated in the protection, uh, had a great role in the protection of Garni Shuka and Tahabart. Um, nowadays, uh, we organize seminars for students and schools. We uh, participate in various events and also we uh, organize 10-day uh, camps where, uh, that happen six times a year. But I have to mention that this only during this year we had seven camps, training camps, and one was with UATE, Union of uh, Advanced Technology Enterprises. So, um, for our courses, we uh, provide courses uh, for all Armenians and residents of Armenia over the age of 16, excluding any type of discrimination, and so far we have trained more than 5,000 people. Um, and now I would like to mention that um, the world, the whole world has undergone many changes and uh, Armenia is one of the hotspots in here. I think no one can uh, argue with that. So we have to be smart, we have to get ready and uh, to get ready to extreme situations, emergency situations, as well as for the battlefield. And all before mentioned courses uh, is, are provided by Goma. So, um, our main purpose is, in Armenian it sounds like Ask Banak Yet Gidamrots. In translation, it would be Army Nation and the Country Fortress. So, what we do is uh, we try to create the uh, Union Guard, National Guard, which uh, not only includes the Army but also can uh, help the police and the MES. Ministry of Emergency Situations. So, um, I think uh, we had the results in this August uh, when uh, we witnessed the great participation of Voma in Surmalu, um, where more than 70 volunteers, our volunteers, helped the MES of Armenia. Besides that, um, in Europe, the idea of general defense has uh, existed for a long time. And for instance, we have Finland, we have Swiss, we have Switzerland. And also, I would like to mention Israel, because Israeli diaspora has many non-governmental organizations that uh, support their people to uh, go come back to their country to train and also to serve in the army. Likewise, our NGO provides the necessities to um, diaspora and to people who want to help their country. So, um, we ha highly value the fact that diaspora makes many investments in Armenia, and especially in our, our organization. And as an example, um, during our 10-day camps, more than 40% of our participants are from diaspora. And also a quarter of our battalion consisted of uh, people from diaspora, which is, I think, a, an extraordinary phenomenon in the modern world, when such huge percentage of diaspora is involved in war in their country. Uh, so, uh, I personally believe that diaspora has a great role in uh, de developing Armenia, so also uh, it has rights to help its country, uh, just like uh, others living here in Armenia because this is their motherland, this is their country as well and also they can help not only financially but also as I mentioned physically. So um, as I've talked about Army Nation, I would like to remind all of you in here that our goal, all of us, we want our country to be safer, we want it to be stronger and um, all we have to do is maybe shed more sweat or tears, but instead shed less blood. So that's it I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nana John. Uh, I think most of uh, the audience already knew about VOMA. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
Our next case is Zahir Ani. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be here and to present one of the most impactful NGOs called Zartnir. So I want to say that I am a support manager in Zartnir and uh, Zartnir is an educational organization, NGO, uh, that was founded in 2017. So what is our mission? Uh, the mission of Zartnir is to create equal educational opportunities for uh, school students, both in Armenia and Artsakh. And uh, it basically purchases great books to, and um, organizes reading clubs. Uh, personally, I want to say that um, before joining the team of Zartnir, I have uh, also been uh, one of the participants of those clubs. Uh, when I was like in 10th grade, uh, one of my friends um, told me about this great opportunity that there is this book club and I was actually super super excited about this opportunity so I also joined uh, one of the reading clubs of Zartnir. So our m mission is to fight against um, reading poverty and um, to boost academic performance. Um, personally, I believe that reading is one of the most important ways to improve, improve yourself and I would say that I wouldn't be um, the person that I am right now without reading books. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about our achievements. So, 83% of school students mentioned that Zartnir positively influences their academic scores. 97% of them are extremely happy uh, to be in Zartnir. And uh, also, Zartnir um, is not only about like uh, reading clubs. Zartnir is also about uh, visiting a lot of uh, good educational places to just uh, give information to students about a lot of opportunities. For example, when I was in um, um, Zartnir, like in the reading clubs, we also did uh, many visits to lots of good places like Pixar and it was really, really good to also do some visits, not only to read um, books. Also 70% of teachers say that Zartnit improves basic skills of students such as oral and written speech. Um, it spreads tolerance among them and also there is this really impactful story that I want to share with you. Um, so when um, students um, were reading the flowers for Algernon. They, uh, most of the students changed their attitude toward the kid who had developmental um, problems, difficulties. And uh, when they read flowers for Algernon book, and the teacher called our founder almost in tears and said the students now accept that kid after reading the book. And also, uh, they literally changed their attitude, which uh, is a really good story to share with all of you. And their parents are extremely happy with such development. Uh, in many schools before Zartnir, almost no students were reading books. After Zartnir, 70% and more students started to read. So basically, um, Zartnir is just improving reading and um, not only reading, but also develops the person. And I would say that um, I uh, really um, developed myself as a person with the help of Zartnir and I'm really, really thankful for that. So this was it. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, uh, let me add something. Uh, Zartnir has made much more examples of um, successful contribution to the kids uh, that uh, are presented on the slide. And also, I would like to mention that the budget of the program is quite, quite low. Um, for example, to add a new school, you need, uh, for, for one educational year, you need approximately $300. So it's not a big amount of money. Yeah. Uh, so if someone wants to contribute to their need, you can talk with Ani or visit the web page. And our last speaker, speakers, sorry, Sona and Narina, one Armenian. Good evening. Um, we're also really grateful for the opportunity to represent our company. We'll keep it really short. 
um, one Armenia for the past decade, uh, one Armenia has been focused on fundraising for non um, uh, uh, for NGOs in Armenia through working uh, on impactful projects and that create jobs in a very transparent way. Uh, for the past 10 years, we successfully implemented 35 projects uh, that uh, have um, positive impact on um, underdeveloped communities. Um, after the war, we raised over $5 million and directed them towards humanitarian needs. After seeing the negative impact that uh, COVID-19 and the war had on the economy of Armenia, and especially on the tourism sector, we recognized the need of uh, future development of the sector. So, because we believe that Armenia has a great potential in um, especially tourism, we decided to shift gears and uh, focus on impact in that sphere instead. Uh, this year, we have set up a new mission for us, which is to uh, accelerate and implement extraordinary travel um, experiences that are impactful and create jobs in order to become number one destination in South Caucasus. This is all a part of uh, the global vision that we have for the country which hasn't changed after since we uh, started our work in 2012, uh, which is which is a um, um, thriving Armenia where local people can make a sustainable and livable income. Uh, setting a goal of um, becoming number one uh, destination in the region is not a small achievement, but is a uh, long-term commitment which we uh, started, which we took on uh, after a decade of advancing transparency and um, impact in um, rural communities. Uh, as Son at all, uh, we changed our orientation to developing sustainable and expansion tourism in Armenia because we want to raise awareness about Armenia and we set a goal to create this emotional connection with Armenia and we thought that the best way to create this connection is through tourism mostly about experiential tourism, which is a really new direction in the tourism in general. And Armenia has all the resources and potential to develop this uh, experience, tourism experiences, which have uh, cultural heritage uh, in the basis. So in 2022, uh, we uh, created uh, the first Armenian experiential travel brand, 2492. And uh, we started creating our all new concepts of tourism experiences, three new concepts, overall with five tourism experiences. Uh, this includes gastro tourism experiences, our wild food adventures, um, which includes the gastronomy cultural heritage, uh, when you enjoy the food, the local food provided by the locals in the most beautiful spots in Armenian nature. Also, we have road trips with Soviet Niva, when you uh, drive through uh, Soviet uh, itinerary, getting uh, familiar with Soviet architecture and Soviet heritage. Also, we have a wine route uh, when you drive the Niva to Wild Store and enjoy the scenery, enjoy the Armenian homemade wines, the wineries, and so on. Also, we have Yerevan Gastro trip when you, uh, because Yerevan is very small, especially in the center, you can. Uh, walk through the city, see the sightseeing, and also enjoy the most delicious food, local food provided by the best restaurants in Armenia. Also, we have partnered with GIZ and together we are, uh, we are now doing uh, implementing Inside Armenia Enhancing Tourism Experiences project and uh, together we are creating over five uh, new tourism experiences which include both gastro experiences, wellness experiences, soft adventure experiences and all these experiences have sustainability and transparency in them. 
So that's why uh, we are supporting our partners. So we don't use the term beneficiaries because all the people we are working with, we are partnering with them. So they are our local partners or regional partners. Uh, we are supporting them uh, by providing hard components which will improve the quality of the experience. Also we are training them. Uh, we, are on, we have partnered with uh, three local guides, we hired them, we trained them to storytelling. So uh, one of the key concepts and key principles of our tourism experiences is the storytelling to tell about Armenia and to again not only raise awareness, not only share knowledge about Armenia but also to create this emotional connection with Armenia both from diaspora and Armenians and also people who are not Armenians. So we also had this slogan that you, <laughs> you are not supposed to be Armenian to be Armenian. So uh, <laughs> we have this mission and we are trying to, to do community development through tourism experiences. Maybe that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me still just three minutes of your attention and then we will go to eat, drink and know each other. Wait. Uh, I think we just start with them. Uh, yeah. uh, in the beginning of the presentation I was talking about uh, lack of information and I noticed that uh, it's one of the main problems which we face and that's why uh, I, together with some partner organizations, uh, decided to, uh, pro, uh, to make a database of Armenian NGOs, which we all need, I think, because, again, for example, you are a donor and you have some amount of money, for example, $1,000, you are ready to contribute to Armenia, and uh, you don't know just which projects do we have, which projects are more um, successful, which are least successful, which have some unique experience in some regions with some demographics, etc. Or for example, you are a government representative, you are head of tourism committee, you want to know which NGOs uh, operate in the tourism sphere. You don't know, you just, uh, you have this information only because of your network and or maybe some Google, or maybe Facebook and that's all, but there's no open shareable database. Uh, and if you mm, want to contribute in uh, making this uh, database or you have some thoughts, uh, wishes, etc., you can come to me and um, share your comments, share your thoughts. Uh, I just want to share some information which we have already collected. Um, yeah, uh, as I already mentioned that uh, there are uh, for sure more than 1,000 funds uh, registered in Armenia, 900, um, 911 of them sent a report to State Revenue Committee, it's a fact, um, but uh, 300 50 of them had no expenses, so they just uh, noticed that they have just zero drum spent in 2021. Um, so they just, uh, they are on the paper, but they don't do anything uh, in reality. Uh, 31 funds spent more than 1 billion drums uh, in Armenia, and top three of funds, here are them, here are they, uh, Zidzaray Ognari. Yeah, uh, it's a f foundation of uh, the soldiers. So the second is Hastanita uh, Askain Zargasman Himna Dram, Territorial Development. Sorry? Regional Development Foundation. And the third is Hastan Himna Dram, Hastan Foundation. So these three, top three, they, um, their expenditures are 44% of total funds expenditures in Armenia, to, uh, only three funds of, um, no, you can calculate approximately six, five hundred and half. So if we take only uh, active funds, on the average, they spent 380 million drums uh, spent in uh, 2021. What will we have in 2022? We will know approximately in the spring of uh, 2023 because they will send their reports, uh, State Revenue Committee will publish them, etc. And just uh, before our event, uh, I've got the information about NGOs, I just didn't have time to put it on the slide. 
Yeah, but I hope that next time uh, we'll be able to share it with you. But uh, to, ha to make a conclusion, total expenditures of funds in 2021 were 213 billion drums. Uh, our state budget expenses, if I'm not mistaken, are one and nine trillion drums. So it's approximately 10% of Armenian government budget expenses. So it's a huge amount. And yeah, something should be done <laughs> with this money. Uh, uh, to tell you the truth, in these funds, there are, for example, foundation of Yerevan State University. They are also registered as a fund. So that's why uh, the picture may be somehow uh, not uh, as clear. Yeah, and distinct, uh, but it's quite interesting information. I will try to publish it as soon as, it, as it's possible. Um, but yeah, and we also would like to talk about Save Armenia. Is here somebody from Move Armenia? No? Okay, um, the, uh, the need of database is quite clear and um, many different organizations uh, talk about it. They, we really need a platform where all NGOs and funds are um, collected together and we will uh, open and see uh, who is really acting in Armenia. And Move Armenia, uh, the organization which I think many of you know, they uh, launched uh, the platform Save Armenia, unfortunately only in Russian, but I hope that uh, they will have an update soon in the English version. So here they um, publish all active NGOs which they know and whom they already checked. Yeah? So you can um, enter the savearmenia.com um, and uh, check um, different NGOs which operate in Armenia. Uh, so uh, before the database will be launched, I don't know uh, how much time will it take. I hope it will be quite soon. Um, as we have already mentioned, you should uh, spread the word about different NGOs. We can cooperate with them in different fields, for example, donate, volunteer, take VOMA courses, uh, buy books for Zartnir, etc. Uh, but maybe there are some specific cases how we can contribute. And uh, in order to discuss it, I invite you to networking and ask to uh, come to different uh, NGO representatives and uh, discuss how you can collaborate, collaborate and uh, make positive impacts. Thank you very much. Please, let's start networking and, we can and discuss discussing the purpose. Yes. <laughs>